Uh, many, many thanks, Jeff, and also many thanks to Palameda for hosting the webinar and inviting us to present. <clears throat> so just a, a bit more context on the back of what Jeff said. I represent two organizations for this webinar. Uh, so there's two, two different perspectives. The first one is I work for a company called Source Code Control. And as, as Jeff said, we, we manage business risk associated with adopting open source software or business risk associated with the development of software using open source components. So we, we tend to be working with senior management, senior procurement in organizations who are inexperienced or uh, have limited exposure to the risk associated with open source. I guess my, my other hat is I'm very actively involved in a UK industry association called Open UK. Uh, so this Open UK is trying to educate all elements of the IT landscape about the benefits of open source and the best way to adopt open source. And um, we are, we're reaching out across the world to bring together similar associations so we can share best practice and educate uh, potential customers or adopters of open source. Now before I get into talking about open source, I want to take you on a, a bit of a journey through history where I think we, we have been here before. So if you go back to the, the late 90s, early 2000s, um, before open source has been adopted, obviously, uh, businesses were deploying software in a very manual way uh, using CDs and, and DVDs. And these CDs and DVDs were being passed around an organization. And it became very difficult and unwieldy for organizations to track and manage where all this software was. And, and when it comes to managing things like version control for security, or um, license management, uh, there's, there's very, very little guidance to how, how would you do that and how would you manage the business risk. And there were service organizations providing services to help companies do this. But every service provider would have a different viewpoint as the best way to, to, to manage that situation. So the industry got together and in, in 2003 there was a publication uh, under the IT infrastructure library, ITIL um, banner called Best Practice for uh, Software Asset Management. Uh, this was initially aimed at UK public sector, but very quickly was adopted globally as a, a guideline and a framework for managing software as, as an asset across an organization. And as, as software evolved, so did that industry. Um, the, the organizations formed like investors in software, who tried to move that forward into more structure. And in 2006, a formal global standard for software asset management was published, which is basically just the processes you would adopt to manage business risk associated with, with software. And, and now software asset management is a global industry. Uh, latest stats are saying uh, going into 2020, it'll be a $1 billion industry of tool providers and service providers helping organize, organizations manage software as an asset. And there's been multiple standards published uh, as, as software has evolved. And in fact, the Dash 2 standard, the second standard there, is a way of tagging software that needs to be managed. Very similar to in the open source world, if you're familiar with SPDX, the uh, Software Packet Data Exchange, of way of tagging open source components. So the reason why I, I told you about that journey, I, I see the open source landscape as following the same sorts of path, but maybe in a slightly different order, uh, where open source now is being broadly used for software developments, is being broadly adopted in various scenarios, cloud, uh, it's been used on, uh, for, for desktop applications, it's been used in Internet of Things, but the, the management and the management of business risk is far behind the advancements from a technology perspective. So the premise of our business is to try and take the learnings of software asset management 
and apply it to the management of open source uh, uh, from a business risk perspective. We've done, we've done a lot of research into the standards market and we have started dialogues both as Open UK and as source, so source code control of how can we work with standards bodies to try and adopt standards. And obviously we've done a lot of research into uh, standards or the lack of. And I'll just then show uh, one example here. The British Standards Institute, who are aligned to ISO, the International Standards Organization, uh, they recently uh, produced a code of practice for the development of health applications. And in a 22 page document, there is only one sentence, which I've pulled out there, uh, with any reference to potential risk with open source components. It doesn't say what that risk is, it just says there is a potential risk. And that highlights for me the need for uh, more involvement of the industry, more involvement of organizations like Palomida, Source Code Control, Open UK, to, to drive that forward to give more guidance to customers to adopt open source in a, in a, in a managed and professional manner, which we, we believe is not there today. Now, if I pick on one particular industry sector, which is really using open source uh, it's, uh, pretty much predominantly across that, that sector, is the area of uh, Internet of Things. So this recent survey from a, a mobile perspective, so an organization called Vision Mobile, you can research the full report on their website. They did, they did a survey of, of, of software developers and overall 91% of developers were saying they are, they are using open source to develop Internet of Things solutions. And I've pulled out three uh, stats from that uh, story behind the number. And you can see the 55% the of developers cited ideology as a reason for using open source. 58% talk about the ability to contribute to projects. But from a business perspective, I'm not saying that that is the wrong decision. No, no, I've no doubt using open source for Internet of Things is the right decision. But the reasons for adopting open source for Internet of Things has a business impact. And I'm going to talk about some of those impacts. Uh, in, a, in, a, in a few moments. So wh where we're coming from is to build the bridge from a business perspective. So businesses looking to manage business risk and collaborating with developers about those sorts of decisions to minimize any potential risk that will, will be passed on to customers who are using the technology being developed. And the reality of software now is that the risks and the dangers are greater than ever before. And just using an example of the auto industry. So in 1941, the original Jeep was brought to market. And obviously, it was before uh, embedded software. So it's very mechanical. And if you wanted to update it, you would use physical tools like a wrench to do that. Fast forward to today and uh, a modern Jeep, a modern Jeep as in the region of 100 million lines of software code, uh, which is growing all the time with the evolution of connected cars and connected cities, uh, multiple operating systems, multiple electronic control units, all potentially developed by uh, multiple suppliers to the auto manufacturer. And the reality of the risks, just, just taking auto industry example further, is because the software is so complex, uh, obviously, uh, people can exploit that complex complexity. So, carrying on with the cheap theme, there's been some high-profile hacking and exploitation of vulnerabilities in in the software of uh, Jeeps and other cars, not just Jeeps. And in one example, a hacker took control of a car and actually killed the ignition so that uh, somebody was vulnerable on a motorway. So obviously the risk to an individual is potential uh, physical harm and the knock-on effects to the supplier of whatever the solution may be, in this case a car, is they face a legal risk of um, litigation for causing um, injury to an individual or other such um, exploitations. <coughs> 
So the risks are getting higher and higher as you guys risk with software. Now there's, there's been so many high profile security vulnerabilities. Uh, some of them are so high profile they have their own logo. So um, most people are aware of Heartbleed, most people are aware of a vulnerability called Shellshock and, and, and Poodle. Um, and Heartbleed was very much a, a turning point in the evolution of open source software where the, the broad public got visibility that um, open source is vulnerable to exploitation and, and attack uh, because of the uh, extent of which it impacted secure websites. What many people don't realize though, since Heartbleed, there's been over 50 further vulnerabilities in that open source project, OpenSSL. Um, so just, just remediating Heartbleed does not necessarily fix future future problems. So it's a continual continual process. And there is a, a national vulnerability database which posts uh, vulnerabilities so people can be aware of those vulnerabilities and if they're in your code you can fix those. There's well over 6,000 vulnerabilities posted on that national vulnerability database. And it grows all the time. It could be vulnerabilities on top of vulnerabilities. Uh, but in a, a recent survey by HP, um, not many organizations have a full process for tracking open source components, identifying open source components, and also fixing or remediating issues with open source components. So it's one thing that there have been uh, high profile press about things like Heartbleed and Shellshock, but if you don't know it's in your code, then you are not going to fix that, and attackers could be probing your technology to try and exploit uh, any on, on, on patch software. And this, this leads on to the dilemma or the conundrum that we see with, with clients that we speak to on a daily basis. So there's two, there's two perspectives. The first one is the developer dilemma. So if you're a developer, first of all, you think about your reputation. You don't want to uh, draw attention to the fact that there may be security flaws in software that you've contributed to or solutions that have, have gone to market which you've contributed to. On top of that, which is um, an area uh, we see as a big issue, is the pressure to deliver software to tight deadlines means that developers will take the shortest cuts possible to deliver the solution to the deadline and that they don't want to get sidetracked on dealing with things like license compliance and security vulnerabilities. And indeed, uh, arguably, their job is to meet those deadlines and be creative in their software development, and uh, it's somebody else's responsibility to manage uh, the risk elements. Then the other side of it is the business dilemma, which is an area we're very focused on. Is We've made businesses aware of potential risk particularly companies who develop software and distribute that software externally. Uh, the potential risks of uh, security vulnerabilities in components of open source and strategies to manage that. And I could safely say that not one business uh, does not have a desire to manage that risk. However, they've got a similar pressure to developers where they've committed to uh, a roadmap of software development as part of a, a, a solution and they've got short release cycles and they can't risk impacting that. They may have shareholders, they may have investors, uh, and they will have customers who are waiting for those future releases. So again, although there's a, a desire to manage risk at a business level, the, they weigh that against the risk of impacting release cycles and they always will put the issue off till tomorrow and the reality of tomorrow is tomorrow never never comes. So that is the conundrum that most organizations face. Open source has been used uh, and driven by technologists uh, without any, any management of business risk and now to implement business controls around software development is the fear of taking away the agility of a, of a business to deliver to those release cycles. And that's what we try to address, and that's what I will try to articulate when I talk about continuous compliance. Then there is the 
licensing landscape of open source, uh, and this is an area um, of license compliance where we've come from. Uh, now, the thing about open source licensing is it's not just an issue of managing intellectual property and complying to licenses. But I'm going to tell you two stories of real life examples where potentially complying to a license could become a security vulnerability in its own, own right. So um, the, the, the kind of spectrum of open source licenses, you've got permissive licenses like Apache and MIT, where you have some obligations you have to meet to comply with their licenses, but in, in, in a broad sense, uh, you're, you're, you're pretty much free to do what you want with those components. You don't have to share your source code of your solution, uh, hence the term permissive. And at the other end, you've got restrictive licenses, uh, often referred to as copyleft licenses, like the GPL, uh, which is the way the Linux kernel is, is licensed. And they have further restrictions. And the key restriction with a copyleft license is you are obliged to share your source code of your solution. And that is the area where it could become not only a compliance issue, but also a security vulnerability issue. So the first example I'm going to give you is from earlier, earlier this year. So the date's important, uh, January, January the 18th. Uh, an organization called uh, JIDE are launching an operating system called Remix which is a, a low footprint operating system um, based on Android and the, the idea is old hardware can be used this operating systems. So gen, in, in January this year they started uh, their PR about uh, this is coming to market. Now in, in a very public way on their, on their online forum somebody posted a question to their support asking for a copy of the source code and um, the response, again, in a very public forum, was you, you, you can't have a copy of the source code. Uh, the individual was not a partner of the organization. And a statement, Remix operating system is not open source, was posted. However, if you go through the installation process of, um, of Remix, uh, there is a reference to the GPL, which I touched on earlier, which is a copyleft license. And to comply with that GPL, uh, even if there's only one component of GPL in the whole solution, is the requirement to share the source code. So this is all going on around January the 18th. And some, some journalists got hold of the story and started making statements like this. Uh, did Remix OS violate the GPL? Obviously, it's, um, using the term violate is um, kind of a very aggressive terminology. So imagine, imagine you are uh, a senior manager or uh, executive of that organization. Uh, you might be an investor in that organization, or you might have shareholders. The last thing you would want prior to the launch of a, a new solution is that sort of press going on. So literally two days later, they issued a statement uh, stating that they are, they are complying with the GPL and the source code is now available for download. Now, um, I don't know the background on that particular organization, and I don't know if they were happy to share their source code or not, but it appeared on the surface of it, their business, business strategy was not to share their source code. And within two days of being challenged, they were sharing their source code. Where, where that potentially becomes a security issue, not just a compliance issue, imagine um, you're a mid-market technology company and you receive a similar challenge and you want to stop any negative press and you share your source code. In two days, you, you, you're unlikely to have enough time to review the source code for security vulnerabilities, uh, and, and fix those vulnerabilities or things like embedded passwords, hard-coded passwords, or even just negative comments that might be in, in the source code because developers weren't expecting the source code to be shared externally. So then anybody could view the source code and exploit any of those vulnerabilities in the code. So that's one example. Another 
uh, auto example is around BMW and their i3. So if you if you if anybody's got a BMW i3 or know anybody with an i3, if you browse through the media player, you'll find a, an open source license notice, which is one of the requirements of complying with open source licenses, and it references again the GPL. So a software developer noticed this and walked into a BMW dealership and requested a copy of the source code for his car or part of his car. And of course, um, from the car sales people, he got blank looks, uh, but they did escalate it to head office. And lo and behold, BMW posted a DVD through the post to this individual. Uh, so there's a guy called Terence Eden. If you look on GitHub, he's on, he's on GitHub. And he, he got the DVD of the source code uh, rather quickly. Uh, and um, he's, he's reviewed the source code, there's components from Wind River, Autos Art, NVIDIA, and so on. And he's, he's uploaded that code to GitHub. So again, the same scenario, if, if, if you're not prepared for that sort of issue, or prepared for sharing your source code, and you have components licensed under a copyleft license, uh, you may find yourself sharing source code which could have vulnerabilities, those vulnerabilities could be exploited. So just two, two kind of random examples of how um, complying with an open source license pans out in the real world. And it goes beyond just license compliance. So now I'm going to talk about more moving into, well, how, how would you manage those situations? And I've got, I've got on the screen a, a typical DevOps process. So development, continuous integration, uh, continuous delivery, continuous testing. And um, the, I've included Puppet. Puppet is an open source tool for um, uh, underpinning a DevOps process. And I, I recently attended a, a Puppet user group in London. I was invited by uh, somebody from Puppet. And, um, as a straw poll of, there's about 30 um, Puppet uh, DevOps engineers in the room. Uh, not, not one person is tasked with monitoring security vulnerabilities in the code that they're, um, they're building and delivering to the organization. So the organizations have deployed up to 20, 25 different releases of one application. So they get instant feedback, goes back to developments, rebuild and redeploy 20 times in one day. Uh, they said the pressure is, is really on them to uh, uh, deliver those, those applications out to users. Uh, likewise, open source licensing is just blank faces. Nobody's ever been challenged about open source licenses. Nobody thinks it's their responsibility. They also said the developers they integrate with, they don't see it as, as their issue. So clearly, it's an, an area where the pressure of, as I touched on earlier, the pressure to deliver solutions to end users is overriding business risks. And we've already talked about some of those business risks. So the question, first of all, is should I audit my code? So one solution would be we've got code in the market or we've got a new release coming out. We could audit that code and fix any vulnerabilities. So that's a very reactive approach. And just fixing issues in code in general, the further down the release cycle you go all the way to, you've already delivered code to a customer, increases the expense of, and the knock-on expense of fixing those, those issues. So if you audit code at the end of the cycle, so uh, maybe in the field test area on, on, the, on the graph on the screen, it's going to be significantly more expensive than if you do it through the development cycle. Uh, so yes, it's good to audit the code. Is it the most efficient way to uh, deal with the issue? No, it's not. Because the knock-on effect will be, if you haven't got a structure for maintaining and updating components of code, uh, then you're going to have to take people off future releases to fix the issues, which has a knock-on impact on future release cycles which again could add to the expense. And if you've already issued the codes to customers, 
then you've got to release the code to them and ask them to update the code, uh, which obviously uh, adds to the cost and the expense. So what we see is a lot of organizations don't do any reviewing of code. The ones that do review code as part of their DevOps cycle, it will be uh, typically a bit of materials at the end of production prior to release and any issues that need fixing get sent back to developments. But there tends to be no structure about what exactly is a copyright issue. Obviously security is fairly black and white. We've got vulnerability, we need to update uh, components. So the compliance piece is what exactly are you trying to comply to? Is there a strategy around that? And 99% of times in, in our experience, there's, there's no strategy from that perspective. So before you can be effective in this, you would need to have an open source policy. So as I said at the beginning, when I talk about compliance, I'm talking about complying with whatever is a business risk to an organization. So a business risk to a company that only develops software for delivery in-house is different to a business risk to an organization that supplies a solution with software to uh, externally to customers, like in the example of the auto industry. So that policy should define what is your strategy around open source, why we're we using open source, and, and do, do we indeed need a policy? Who needs to be involved? It's not just developments that will be potentially uh, legal. There could be potentially third-party investors. There will be product, product management. There could be security management. There could be HR if you're changing uh, people's um, terms of employment based on uh, the policy. And how are you going to implement it successfully? Uh, what is the scope? Uh, some organizations we've worked with uh, define an open source policy and also mandate that onto third-party suppliers. So they could be using third-party organizations to develop parts of a solution, and they push that policy onto them. So then they have to adopt the same policy for the customer to accept the code that's being developed. Um, how, do you how do you apply it? Uh, you can do things like define a whitelist and a blacklist of licenses and uh, component licensing, uh, what tools should be used uh, for managing the process. So that's where a Palameda would come in to play. And, and how, do you how do you communicate that across the organization? So I'm working with um, a very significant organization at the moment who are going through the process of implementing a policy. And our first meeting with head of procurement, head of development, uh, head of software uh, infrastructure. Uh, first of all, they, they wanted to quantify what is the risk around open source software. So it was a bit of an education piece for them. The second meeting was about, we think we should manage it, how do we do it? And we're talking about the policies. And the, the, the challenge that they have, and it goes back to the slide I put up about the conundrum, is they're concerned about upsetting software developers and disrupting their development cycle. So part of the process that we're going through is a communication process. So before we've even defined a policy or how we're going to implement that policy is we're doing very short awareness sessions, education sessions about the risks of open source, why it needs to be managed, the benefits of managing it, and how it can be done without disrupting uh, software development. So in their words, they wanted to get the buying of employees before enforcing any, any policies through uh, human resources. So a very simple example, so you've got your policy. Say um, I work for a technology company and we're going to share some libraries on GitHub. Uh, but we want to do it in a controlled way. We want to demonstrate we've got good business processes. So you go through that process, you create your, your policy, and that policy will be dynamic and will evolve with changes in technology and the organization. Um, so you have software development on the left. They're, 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 they're developing and producing code 
uh, into virtual repositories. And on the right-hand side, you might have uh, third-party contributors who are modifying and, and adding uh, to uh, the library that's being developed. So, um, and then through the continuous compliance methodology, all that code is being managed in line with the open source policy. If there's a new release, there's a bill of materials produced that itemize all the components. It's time stamped. So on this date and time, uh, there's no known security vulnerabilities uh, posted on the National Vulnerability Database in any component in our code. And this is how it is licensed. Um, so say, for instance, with a library, you might be licensed under uh, a lesser GPL, LGPL license. But then from a, a management perspective, and this is where we don't find many organizations with this level of visibility, um, for senior management on the top left is they're not interested in the details of software code, software languages. They just want a summary for their management meetings and say, in the, in the past month, in the past two weeks, uh, there's been X number of vulnerabilities, say 10 vulnerabilities found uh, or placed on natural vulnerability database in our code. Uh, developments are aware of it. Developments were made aware of it on this date and time. They have a service level agreement that they will fix that vulnerabilities, say, within three working days, and it will be released into the GitHub repository. And then the following meeting they have, they can get an update on whether those vulnerabilities were reported. So the point being is business management can never turn around and say if there's an issue with software supplied to a customer that they had no visibility of a vulnerability in their code. So that is, in very simplistic terms, what a good you know, uh, a governance program for managing open source. But it all hinges on having a policy that you are continually compliant to. So it goes beyond just compliant to the license terms of, say, GPL or, or Apache, ensuring you meet those obligations. It's anything that is relevant to your organization. Uh, and understanding and quantifying the business risk of not managing those issues. And if you, if you do it in this way, with this continuous compliance, where code is monitored and there's a structure and education for software developers, it should not impact one minute on a release cycle for software. So developers know the boundaries, they know the components they can be, be using, they know somebody else is monitoring those components for risks, so they don't have to worry about that. It could be a separate maintenance team, and they can be fully focused on uh, going through their, their, their scrum process and ensuring they're delivering code on time. So, so that is a, a turning a reactive situation into a proactive, continuous compliance. So uh, on top of continuous delivery, on top of continuous testing, you've got all the way through the process. Uh, so if, if there's a component that's never been used before, it can go through a pre-approval. Uh, which, if it's set up properly, shouldn't take long at all, or should be fairly instantaneous. Uh, for each stage of software development and and software build, there could be scanning of the code going on. So, when it comes to the final build analysis, so the bill of materials, which will be time stamped, really there should be no issues at that point in time, unless there was a vulnerability announced on the National Vulnerability Database that day or the day, day day before. So that should be a checkbox exercise. The report is generated, it's issued to management, it can be issued to uh, customers. So they you've got transparency with customers, they know exactly what's in your code and how you're managing it. Uh, and therefore everybody should be happy and compliant with your process. So that is um, what we've, we're trying to educate customers uh, both in the UK and, uh, and beyond the UK, of a good process for managing software, and it goes beyond software development. Now, I've talked a lot about business risk and, and business impact. Um, where, where we're finding a business impact, where senior management in organizations are being challenged to um, put in some process for managing software, open source software development. 
Uh, outside of the traditional investors and merchant acquisitions, which if you research risk in open source, there's, there's quite a lot of articles on that. Um, first of all, we're seeing a maturity in IT procurement. Uh, in Europe, in particular in the open source space and the public sector space, we're seeing um, pressure from, um, from governments to uh, get pu public sector, local councils, health providers to adopt open source or at least evaluate open source solutions on a level playing field with proprietary. Um, and so what procurement people are looking for is how professional is the software that's been pitched to them uh, and being positioned within your organization compared to proprietary solutions. And what's, what's emerging is this term professional reusable software or professional open source software. So it's a differentiator between downloading some code off GitHub and implementing it yourself and the professional reusable software, which is there is some structure and, and that structure can be demonstrated that there is maintenance and support in a structured way for things like security vulnerabilities, the suppliers or the implementers and supporters of the software are providing uh, a, a, a policy which is transparent, so they've got a licensing policy. And there's, there's been some recent discussions actually about what exactly is open source. So there are organizations who position themselves as open source software uh, vendors, uh, but there are some restrictions in their use of open source. So an example is open core where there is a basic version of a solution which is fully open and you can review the source code. But then uh, extended um, value-add components of the software is licensed differently and more proprietary and you can't access those unless you pay. So there's a big debate in the open source industry world about should you be defining that as open source. So anyway, IT procurements are becoming more and more educated to this. The knock-on effect, if you're a company supplying a software solution, then the pressure will be on you to be able to demonstrate you are delivering professional reusable software over just open source software uh, without any structure. The other area which uh, we're finding quite a significant increase is in the insurance industry. So I've put cyber insurance, but it's insurance in general, where, and it's from two standpoints. We're seeing more organizations taking insurance out uh, in case there is a legal challenge or an issue with a solution they've provided to customers where they've been impacted and exploited a vulnerability that they pass on to a client. Now, because of that, um, insurance companies are also looking at the way they insure organizations and they're looking to uh, organizations for proof that again they've got a structured way of managing potential liabilities. So um, we, we've seen visibility of, uh, first of all, a company taking out insurance who are adopting policies and challenging their insurers for a reduction in their premiums because they're taking extra measures to manage this. Uh, the other side of it is we've seen insurance companies challenging organizations and stating they will potentially increase premiums unless the organization looking to be insured can demonstrate they've got control. So the knock-on effect at a business level, that will all, all waterfall down and impact software development at some point. And it will just be about adopting those processes we talked about earlier in the presentation. And then, like I said, the more traditional where companies are seeking investments or uh, venture capitalists investing in tech organizations, which a lot are, looking to understand any risk, particularly IP risk, uh, uh, that might impact the return on investments of uh, who they're investing in. And also, yeah, we find it in uh, the valuation of intellectual property, where an organization will have valued their intellectual property, and if the software involved, if they can't demonstrate uh, 
the components that have been used for the development of that software, the potential valuation could decrease if, for instance, they are forced to share their source code and the whole USP of that organization is in the source code. And similarly, in mergers and acquisitions, it's a similar story. What risk are being taken on by a, one company buying another company? Um, so finally, um, I've mentioned this term professional reusable software and I mentioned Open UK. We recently published a document aimed at procurement. It was aimed at public sector, um, although what's, what's talked about in this publication is relevant to any type of organisation, but a lot, of, a lot of the reference material is public sector focused, about a practical approach to assessing uh, free and open source software and understanding what is free and open source software and is it professionally managed. The idea is to help particularly IT procurement take the risk out of a decision to adopt an open source solution over another open source solution or a proprietary solution in a measured and factual way. So the feedback we've had from procurement uh, as an industry body is we want to adopt open source but we don't understand how to negotiate terms with an open source supplier. Therefore, we will carry on with a more expensive, potentially proprietary solution. So if, if, you're, if you're interested, that's a free download. It's on the media library of Open UK. It's also on our website as well. Uh, but it's a good high level introduction if, you, if, you're, if you're new to this. But it's the, it's the, it's the, it's the maturity of open source and you know, going back to the roadmap that happens with software asset management, this is part of the journey that's happening with open source software, and it's the, it's the maturity of the open source industry. So business controls are catching up with uh, technology and software developments, and hopefully it will help the adoption of open source solutions, uh, and everybody should be happy at the end of the day. Um, so with that, I'll hand back to, to uh, Jeff uh, to summarize, and we can take any, any questions there might be. Thank you, Martin. This is Jeff Lush from Palomita. I really want to thank you for spending the time with us today and the very informative uh, session that you gave us here. We, we have a couple questions for you, and uh, yeah. uh, between uh, perhaps between Roman and mine. Um, I'm reading here on the panel. Um, a person here says, "How do you get engineers to to get excited or to do to do this?" Um, I guess you know one of the the concerns that people very often have is, "I want to ship my software. I just got to get my features that are out there." Um, how do you? Uh, what, what have you done to, to help engineers get excited about this or 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 you know pay attention to this when when they're just trying to get features out the door? What, what, well, what, what they find with developers is they have a, they're very interested in the detail of things like software licensing, and and also that they don't have a desire to ship uh, flaky or insecure code. Um, and like I said, like I said with the example about Internet of Things, uh, they're making decisions to adopt open source and the reasons why. Uh, I've, I've done workshops with software developers. <coughs> They're very, very interested in, in, in debating the pros and cons of licenses. So the, the, what, the way we work with organizations is, um, it's like I touched on with one example, is before implementing any kind of controls around, around this, is have them engaged in the process. And um, for, for one organization, we're, we're doing a series of uh, informal kind of lunch and learn sessions uh, debating the issues of open source, so it won't be uh, us talking for them or, or the organisation talking to them. It's very much a, a kind of open debate about the challenges of open source, uh, which my, my experience is developers are fascinated by anyway, and they feel part of the process. And that's part of getting them brought into the process. And ultimately, ultimately, a, a well implemented process uh, won't impact those deadlines. It will just become part of their working life. And the, the company I'm referencing is what they're fearful of is all of a sudden coming out with a policy, the developers don't understand why it's being done, and they feel 
it's somebody taking power away from them. And of course, they will react negatively to that. So that, um, to summarize an answer to your question is have them engaged in the process, ed educate them about why they need to do it, uh, and if they're part of the process, they'll be on board. And then, and then going forward beyond that, once the process is implemented, uh, it should become part of the onboarding process of an employee or a contract. And if it's always been there from day one and they know no difference, then they're fine with it. It's only when you make a change to somebody's working practices that they're used to that it can be perceived as negative. Does that kind of make sense? Very much. Thank, thank you, Martin. Yeah. Um, Next question I, I, I have here is, um, what are ways to start? Um, if, if you haven't done anything, what's the best way to, to think about starting this process? Well, uh, from experience, most, most people don't know where, where they're at. We've um, got companies who don't even know they, they use an open source uh, in software development or in the organization. Is, um, First of all, a, a review of any code for any issues. So that could be um, just pick an application, do a review, and just do a report as an example of, and you could extrapolate then if you've got one, one application, it's got 50 vulnerabilities uh, and, and 10 different license types which potentially conflict. That's, you extrapolate that to 30 other applications, you've got an idea of the level of risk. Um, and then the other thing on the process side is, I suppose we refer to it as a gap analysis of how you manage it today. So again, from from experience, um, uh, one company I'm talking to, their senior management went, went through the process of understanding it and asked us to come in and say, well, can you review how we manage it now, i.e. they weren't clear do they manage it? Do they not manage it? So it's just reviewing where you're at today. And if you've got some hard data, so if you just pick some some code uh, at random, uh, don't do any pre-cleaning of the code. So it's a, a factual, this is where we're at today as regards risk. And then what do we do about that? So you can fix the vulnerabilities, but you haven't fixed the source of the problem about why did we end up with vulnerabilities in the first place? And that's where the process and the continuous compliance comes in. And it's not so. It's, it's a journey that you go on. It's not. It's not something that you implement overnight. It's, it's one step at a time. Great. Thank, thank you, Martin. And I believe that Roman has two other questions from the from the listeners here. So I'm going to turn this over to Roman for those two questions. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, two questions um, from my side. The first question is from Stephen Schwartz. Uh, Martin, uh, do you know how many firms do not have cyber insurance? Well, um, I, I, my, my understanding, and this is a very UK perspective, uh, the cyber insurance that people are taking out is more about defense mechanisms against exploitation, so uh, things like firewalls. It's a it's a very very low percentage of people who take insurance out about code vulnerabilities. So o o overall, I would say very low. Also, a straw poll of insurance uh, brokers and insurance companies and insurance specialists that we've been working with, they um, I've I've got questionnaires they send to clients and reviews they do. They only manage at a system level or evaluate at a system level the ability of an organization to uh, uh, avoid vulnerability. So it's more de defensive. And then the other side of it is companies take out very expensive insurance uh, against everything just in case. And because the insurance organization can't quantify the risk, obviously the premium is quite high. So um, one, one, of our, one, of our, one of our clients I met with this week, and actually we, t we talked about insurance, and they've, they've, they've gone down that road. They've taken insurance against IP litigation. They've taken insurance uh, against uh, any cyber 
uh, cyber attack on one of their customers and their own internal systems. So it, I, I'd say from an open source management perspective, it's a very uh, new thing. Um, an, an organization that advises in the UK CIOs and CTOs of the, the largest organizations, so the FTSE 250 organizations, I'm doing a present, presentation on open source, they've recently just had an event with a insurance um, insurance specialist. So this is advising you know, 250 largest organized corporates in the UK uh, about why they should look at insurance, what they should insure, and uh, what, what they can avoid. Uh, so that says to me, there's obviously a level of immaturity uh, in this space, but I think from, from conversations I've had, the insurance industry is waking up to a risk that they're not, they've not got visibility of companies managing. Great, thank you, Martin. And um, we have we have one more question, and maybe um, I will let both of you answer it, uh, as it seems a bit generic. Um, so this question is coming from Rahul Kumar, and um, the question is: Do you think that companies are getting on board to deal with open source only because they feel scared about the risk uh, and not because they know the benefits of uh, open source software overall. So maybe maybe Jeff, can you, or yeah, yeah. Jeff or Martin, yeah. Yeah, Jeff, you go first. Sure, I, I think it's a great question. Uh, thanks for that. It, it, there's many reasons I see for people embracing open source. Uh, number one is obviously the cost. Um, it does not require an NDA to be signed. I can go download, um, download basically a library just instantly. Uh, I may have policies at work. I may have rules at work. But in terms of getting the code or playing around with it, it's very easy. I think that's one of the, the main reasons why people are embracing open source. Also, what we see is it, it, there's been an, an explosion of, of just amazing technology that's coming in the open source world. So again, it's very easy to get. There's, a, there's some very uh, innovative things being done. And I think that's, those are the main reasons why people are doing that. Um, there is a, a feeling, too, that maybe sometimes open source will, will have more eyes on it, meaning maybe it is more secure than maybe an equivalent uh, proprietary piece. That's been in some of the literature. It's been one of the discussion points. Uh, you know, I think that's maybe a 50-50 uh, uh, accurate statement there, but it is a, a, an item that people will, will often say what, why they picked open source. Martin, any, anything you want to add to that? Yeah, I, 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 um, I, I kind of go back to uh, the maturity of open source. Um, you know, in, in, the view, the view of um, say Open UK. I, there was a an event we had called Open for Business recently, and from a development perspective, the general view is open source is one. It's the it's the quickest, most efficient way to develop software. What what we are finding is um, businesses waking up to it's not a panacea of of, of software, in so much as you know there used to be this. Statement, I think, came from Linus Torvalds that many eyes mean fewer, fewer vulnerabilities or fewer bugs. I think people have woken up to the fact that's not the case, and it's software is software and it needs to be managed. I think I think organisations accept open source is credible, um, but what they don't understand fully is how to manage it. Um, and I have an experience of proprietary vendors using tactics uh, to get organizations to dismiss open source solutions based on that fear and uncertainty. So if, if we move to this world of professional managed open source and, and define what that is, it's easier for um, organizations adopting solutions which could be proprietary open source like ERP systems and CRMs. Um, if the structure behind the management of it, they know they can get the software quicker because open source software development is um, as proven as the best way to develop software. So it's just the business 
management's catching up with with the uh, software and technologists who've moved it forward. Thank you very much, Martin. I think this, uh, these are the all questions we have. Um, so if you have any further questions, please do feel free to send them over to one of the emails that you see uh, right now. Um, otherwise, I would like to thank everyone for attending today's webinar.